Welcome to police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 25, a shooting on Echo Park Avenue. That's all. Rose and Cliff. Crimes quickly. 
This division, although given little publicity and public recognition, is responsible for a large percentage of cases solved by the police department and the discovery of legal evidence necessary to convict criminals who, in the absence of proof of guilt, might escape punishment. Professor Lindsley will now go on with the story. On the evening of April 9, 1927, Melvin Hatch dropped around to the Lonesome Dance Club, which is owned and managed by his parents. It has been Melvin's custom to call for his father, who is an invalid, early in the evening, take him home, and then return for his mother. Hello, Mother. Hello, son. Oh, hello, Dad. How are you feeling this evening? Not bad, Melvin. A little better than yesterday. Well, that's fine. A nice crowd tonight, Mother. Yes, we've had a good night so far, taking in over $200. Gee, that's great. You'll make a million out of this place yet. Oh, hardly that. Well, maybe not. But it is a good idea, having a place like this where lonely people can get together and have a good time. Well, your father and I can appreciate what it means. We were lonely enough out here while you were away at war, Melvin. Well, you needn't worry about that any longer, Mother, because I'm never going away from you again. Oh, I hope not, son. You look pretty tired, Dan. You ready for me to take you home? Yes, son. I guess so. Now run along, Papa, and don't wait up for me. Melvin drives his father home and returns to the dance hall. A few moments after he has entered the house, Dr. Hatch hears the doorbell ring. Mrs. Hatch home? Why, well, no, but I'm expecting her. Shut up, you old fool, and get inside there and keep uh, quiet. Uh, well, what are you going to do? Nothing to you if you keep your mouth shut. Now get in that closet. Listen, I'm a sick man. All right, now don't cry about it. Lie down on that couch a minute. I want to see what you've got on you. Oh, no, please. A wallet. And 20, 30, 40 bucks in it. Not bad. All right. You can get up now. Please go away. You have all my money. Won't you go now? I should say not. Your wife is coming home with several hundred more, and I'm oh. going to get that, too. Oh, she won't have any money on her. She's just been visiting a friend. Now, don't give me that. I know she's down to the dance tonight, and I know that she'll bring home the gate receipt. She always does. How do you know that? Hey, you don't suppose I go into this without figuring out every angle, do you? The best thing you can do is to keep quiet. You just sit there by the fire as though nothing happened. Go on, sit down. I'm going to turn this light out, and I'm going to wait in that closet until she comes home. And don't you try any funny business, because I got this gap lined up on you every minute. home, he walks to the porch with his mother. 
Don't bother coming in with me, son. I can handle these packages. Oh, it's no trouble, Mother. No, you're tired now. Run along. All right, Mother. Good night. Good night. Well, I declare the key is not under the mat. Papa, let me in. It's me, Papa. Let me in. There's a mother here now. She has this gun trained on you. Hand me the bag. <laughs> What's the matter with her? Stand it. Stay back. Stand it, son. Don't go in the house. Run away. Oh, don't stand it. <laughs> oh. Why, you lie down there. Oh, my son. My son. <laughs> Within three minutes, officers Hamilton and Tucker are on the scene. And a half minute later, the police ambulance arrives and removes Melvin to the hospital in a very serious condition. Police Sergeant Fredrickson of the Fingerprint Bureau is the next official to appear. Why well, little hope to go on, Sergeant. The suspect is described as about 5 feet 10 inches tall, weight 160 pounds. Age, about 25. Now, there's thousands like that in any large city. Yeah, that's right. And he was mad. So there's no facial description. That's right, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Hess. Yes? Would you mind pointing out to me the various articles the suspect touched while he was in here? Well, oh, yes. Hmm. Let's see. He had a hold of the doorknob. Hmm, the doorknob, eh? Let me see. Uh, no, there's nothing there. I don't think he touched anything else. He seemed to be careful not to. Oh, yes. He hid in the closet. He must have touched the knob on that door, too. Which closet is that? That one. Over there by the fireplace. Well, we'll take a look at it. No, nothing on the knob. Looks pretty hopeless. No. Wait a minute. Here's a smudge on the edge of the door. I'll just dust that. Bring out the marks, huh? Mm-hmm. This is what you call a latent fingerprint. When you put this powder on it, you can make it out. See? Yeah. Say, hey, that's pretty swell. You know, fingerprinting always interested me. You ought to come around the bureau sometime. Lieutenant Barlow, our boss, is one of the smartest fingerprint men in the country. Is that a fact? Yes, sir. Now, Tucker, if you'll hold this door steady, I'll just photograph this, baby. There. Perfect print. Yeah, but look, Sergeant. That's only the print of one finger. That's right. The index finger. That isn't any good for identification, is it? Well, it wouldn't be in most places, but Barlow will know what to do with it. He has a whole file of single fingerprints. Yeah? Sure. There are only three others like it in the world. One at Wichita, Kansas, one at Berkeley, California, and the other in Scotland Yard. Well, I'll be darned. This is some outfit we belong to, isn't it? The next morning, Melvin Hatch dies. His assailant is now a murderer. Lieutenant Barlow classifies the single fingerprint found at the scene of the crime as W3C4, the letter W meaning a whorl, the number three indicating a core formation with a circular spiral to the right, the C standing for an inclination sloping to the left, and the four indicating the count between the core and the nearest delta. This long fingerprint is filed with the prints of wanted men as it does not correspond to any of the other thousands of prints on file at police headquarters. Meanwhile, other means are being used to identify the murderer. Every person's character remotely resembling the description of the wanted man is rounded up and brought into headquarters. Lieutenant Barlow and Detective Sanderson then interview Mrs. Hatch. I regret very much, Mrs. Hatch, that we have to ask you to come down here at this time. Oh, it's quite all right, Lieutenant. I'll do anything to find the man who killed my boy. Anything. Well, Mrs. Hatch, we rounded up some suspects, all answering the general description given by you and your husband. 
I wish you brought him with you. I couldn't today, sir. He's all broken up. This terrible thing is almost too much for him. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. You say you have some suspicious characters here? Yes, but we don't see how you can tell much about them. After all, the man who shot your son was mad. How could you identify Robert if you did oh, see him? I'd know him anywhere. How? Oh. By his voice. By his voice? Certainly. But Mrs. Harris, that sort of identification is too flimsy. Why, no jury in the world would convict a man on that score. I can qualify as an expert on voices, gentlemen. I used to teach voice culture in the public schools in Wisconsin. I know I'll never forget the voice of that man. He said only two sentences, hand me the bag and lie down there. But the tone of his voice is indelibly engraved in my mind. I'll never, never forget it. Well, I don't know, Mrs. Hatch. It's one of the strangest means of identification I've ever heard of. But maybe it's worth something. What kind of a voice would you say he had? Well, it, it was a finely modulated, cultivated voice. He was an educated man. I recall the last words he spoke to my son. He told him to lie down, not lay down, as an ignorant person would have done. Maybe there is something to it, Lieutenant. Yes, it's worth a try. <laughs> Lieutenant Barlow and Detective Sanderson lead the distraught mother into the show-off room. The suspected men are led out behind the screen. Their faces lit up by blinding light so that they cannot see the people beyond the screen. Lieutenant Barlow addresses them. Now I want you men to repeat these words. Hand me the bag and lie down there. Start with the men on the left. Hand me the bag, lie down there. Next. Hand me the bag. Lay down there. Next, ma'am. Hand me the bag. Lie down there. Let me hear him say it again. Repeat that, will you? Hand me the bag. Lie down there. No, that isn't the boy. Go on, Lieutenant. All right, the last man. Hand me the bag. Lie down there. Okay, that's all. Take him back, Sergeant. Yes, well, Mrs. Hatch? No, none of these men was the man who killed my son. Time after time, Mrs. Hatch goes through the ordeal of the shadow box. But never does she hear the voice for which she has listened. The weeks drag in the months. Then, mile away Thomas, notorious racketeer, is shot in a fight with the police. Dr. and Mrs. Hatch consent to view the corpse in the hope of making a definite identification. Lieutenant Barlow escorts them into a gray, bare room in the morgue. An attendant pulls the sheet away, revealing the features of the corpse. Oh. I think he is too large to be the man we're looking for. It might be he. Oh, if only I could have heard him speak. Then I'd be sure. Many officers in the police department are of the opinion that the murder of Melvin Hatch was another of Mile Away Thomas's crime, and so considered the case closed. But to Lieutenant Barlow, who constantly pours over his precious fingerprint file, no case is closed until he gets a positive identification. And the fingerprints of Mile Away Thomas do not match the single print that he received from the door at the hat home. Shortly afterwards, Dr. Hatch, grief-stricken by the death of his son and weakened by his long illness, died. The possibilities of identification are thereby lessened to Mrs. Hatch's recognition of a voice, uttering seven short words, and to Lieutenant Barlow's matching a single fingerprint. Three years passed, and then another crime is shrieked across the front pages of Los Angeles newspapers. It is June 25th, 1930. 
Here comes that messenger now. Where did he come from? Well, he's just turned the corner of First Street. Now, take it easy. See that open place there beyond the truck? Sure. I... Well, gauge your speed so that you'll pull him there just as he's walking past. All right, I'll go. Okay, swing it. Give me that bag. Hey, what's this? See this yet? Give it to me or I'll... Give it to me. Okay, he drives like hell. All right. Hey, police! 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 Hey, let us a neat job, Pete. Let's get down to Wilmington as soon as we can. Sure, if this is can, the hose it together. I wish you'd get a car with a good of bright and a little bit of a pep when you steal them. Well, I couldn't help it. I think the only one I could get away with. Sure, but someday it's going to get us into big trouble. Ah, we'll fix this one as soon as we get back. Well, I sure hope so. I don't like him. Look, point. there's a truck coming out of that alley. Look out! Stop it! Stop it. You all right, Pete? I don't know. I just... Well, I'm taking it on the lam. I got to get that Joe out of here before the cops come. I'll see you back at the joint. All right, boys. Just scram on the door. Go ahead. What's hey, what's the big idea running to me like that, huh? My bright's the bad. Oh, yeah? Well, where's your friend going? Oh, he's going to uh, call it uh, the insurance company. Yeah? I guess I better tell that to this officer here. What's the trouble, boys? This stiff comes wobbling along in this old crate and runs into me when I'm coming out of the alley here. And then his friend scrams to call the insurance company. Yeah. Sounds fishy to me. Where do you live, buddy? Who, a me? Yes. A devil's is out of my. My insurance company, she's to take care of all of that. You'll have to give me your name for my report. Sir, listen to me, will you? If you're going to give me a ticket, give him a to me. I'll pay off. You? What's your hurry to get away? I've got an uh, important appointment. Well, let me look at your license, please. Go ahead, pard. I'll see this monkey don't get away. I ought to smack you down. All right, shut your mouth. Hey, one more crack out of you and I'll let you have it. Who's this car belong to? This is the car she's belonging to me. Yeah? Sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. Well, there's something funny about it. This is reported as a stolen car. I'll have to take you in until we can clear this thing up. Yeah. I knew there was something fishy about this guy, son. Although Solano said Foxy refuses to talk, Police discover several addresses on his person. Running these down, bring them at last to a house in Wilmington. What do you want? We're looking for Pete Solano. He lives here, doesn't he? Well, he did, but he, he's out of town. What do you mean, out of town? Well, he hasn't been here for a week. Well, how about the guy that lives with him? Is he here? Well, I really don't know. That's not Pete around the bushes. They were police officers. He just bothered? Well, what of it? Just this. He's going to show us up to Solano's room. But I don't know if he's in. Oh, I don't know if he's good. Oh, yes, you should. You wouldn't want to get in a jam sucking the law, would you? Well, no. Okay, lead the way. Well, come on. Say, be careful of Mr. Eberly if he's in. He's um, a sort of a dangerous character. This is as far as I'll go. He's in the second door to the left. Okay, lady, thanks. Better run limber your gad, Jack. You may need it. Right. Try the door first. If it's unlocked, fire's right in. Okay, let's go. Hey, hey what do you see? Pick him up, I believe. We're police officers. Up, he said. Keep your hands away from that pillow. Better take that gun away from him, Jack. Okay. Hey, what's the rap? Robbery. <laughs> Beverly is brought in, fingerprinted, indicted, and speedily sentenced to prison on four counts of robbery. As he waits in county jail to be transported to San Quentin, Lieutenant Barlow is in his office making one of his customary checks from the fingerprint files against the prints found at the scene of the unsolved crime. Well, what are you up to this afternoon? Oh, just making the check back on the old unsolved crime. A lot of work, isn't it? It's yours when you have 230,000 sets of prints on file. Hmm, that many? Yeah, but it isn't as bad as it sounds. Because the code classifications cut down the number of sets you have to go through to check any particular print thing. Hmm. It's a lot of fun. You never know what you might find. Now, take this print here, W3C4. Does that mean anything to you? Hmm, I was saying. Remember Mrs. Hatch? Oh, yeah, the little old lady whose son was killed, and she said she could identify the murderer by the sound of his voice. Yeah, that's the one. Mm-hmm. Well, W3C4 is the code of the single fingerprint we found at the scene of the crime. They never found anything on that, did they? Oh. Uh-huh. 
But every now and then, I check over the files just in case. Let's look it up now. Hmm? Sure. Now, let's see. Here's the W file. Now, we'll see how many W3s there are. Hmm. Quite a few. Hmm. See? Then we'll eliminate everything but the W3Cs. Only three of them. Well, I'll be doggone. What is it? Well, here's the same print, W3C4. Yeah? Who is it? Let's see. Percy Eberly, convicted on four counts of robbery. Look at the comparison of these prints. Hmm. Identical. I can see 20 points of similarity. And you don't need more than seven to convict, do you? No, sir. Sanderson, we've run down another unsolved crime. <laughs> Eberly is surprised to be summoned from the cell in which he is awaiting his trip to prison as a bank robber and taken to detective headquarters to face Barlow and Sanderson. Eberly, where were you on the night of April the 9th, 1927? Huh? How the devil should I know? That was over three years ago. Well, perhaps I can refresh your memory. On the night of April the 9th, 1927, you shot Melvin Hatt. What the hell are you talking about? I have definite proof that you're the murderer of Melvin Hatt. Hey, this heat must be getting you, Lieutenant. I don't know anyone by the name of Hatch. You're positive of that, Everly? Uh, sure I am. You didn't kill Melvin Hatch? No, of course I didn't. Very well. In that case, you wouldn't mind appearing in the shadow box so we can clear up the similarity, eh? I know. I'll go into the show up. Good. When we want to, we'll call you. <laughs> Mrs. Hatch is hastily summoned to police headquarters and arrives breathlessly eager to find what news the officers have. They explain that they have a possible suspect whose voice they would like her to hear. Once more, as she had been so many times before, she is led into the darkened show-up room. I hate to ask you down here, Mrs. Hatch. You may be on the wrong track again. Quite all right, Lieutenant. I've come down a thousand times so long as we get the man who killed my son. You're a brave woman to go through this ordeal time and again, Mrs. Hatch. Well, it's nothing. I'll live for the day when I'll see justice done. Are you ready to see the men? Yes, I'm quite ready. Bring in the prisoner, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Does that look like him, Mrs. Hatch? Well, I can't be sure. Ask him, ask him to say those words. Beverly, I want you to repeat these sentences. Hand me the bag and lie down there. Hand me the bag. Lay down there. That's he. I'd know that voice anywhere. It is the man who murdered my boy. <laughs> Equipped with the evidence of identical fingerprints and Mrs. Hatch's positive identification of the voice, Deputy District Attorney Joseph Choate entered the courtroom on December 3rd for a long, drawn-out court battle in which the defense tried to break down the value of fingerprints as positive identification. The hammering attempts to discredit Captain Barlow's justly earned reputation as a leading authority on fingerprints failed, although the jury could not come to an agreement, and the case had to be retried. Finally, a second jury, after 24 hours' deliberation, found Percy Everly guilty with a recommendation of life imprisonment. And accordingly, on February 27, 1931, Everly was sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin on a charge of murder and to from five years to life on charges of robbery. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen... Every year, police cars, fire engines, ambulances, motorcycles, and other emergency equipment travel millions of miles in their daily jobs of protecting the lives and property of citizens living in Southern California and Arizona. These millions of miles are run with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. No motorist will ever require from his car the results demanded by police and fire departments. Results delivered by Rio Grande cracked with Tetra Ethel. But why not get this extra performance? Rio Grande Cracks with Tetra Ethel costs you no more. And when you try Rio Grande Cracks, why not try its famous companion product, Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil? 
These famous oils give longer life because they are extra refined. Also, you are positively guaranteed against substitution because both are sold only in extra measure tamper-proof cans. With all their advantages, it is surprising that Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline cost no more than ordinary oil. <laughs> Frederick Stark. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the real.